Hello, and welcome to Tabletop Bellhop Live, episode 29, Lost in Translation. What to do when you've got a bum rule book. Hamilton, Ontario, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions, and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop and continue on even after the double bell ends the show for more Off the Books After Show. We love hearing from our listeners and viewers. Each week, we hope to highlight some of that feedback, whether positive or negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions. If you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can also hit us up on social media, where I can be found everywhere as tabletopbellhop, one word. And I can be found as Dark Elf LX. Now, we got a couple responses to our Shadowrun beginner box review I thought were worth sharing. Martin Vos writes, I've got to admit, your assessment assessment of the Shadowrun Beginner Box is not wrong. Shadowrun 5th Edition is a great game, but the editing of most of the books is truly atrocious. It was only the second Matrix source book that finally explained clearly how the Matrix is used. Well, thanks, Martin. It's a shame that they put so much money into layout and design, which was noticeably mm -hmm. good, but not editing, it seems. Now... James Spawn of White Star Fame writes, Shadowrun remains one of my favorite concepts and favorite settings in the history of role-playing games. It's so many disparate aspects of the rule of cool rolled into one single setting that it's just a hell of a ride. Unfortunately, obtuse mechanics, badly explained rules, and an endless system of caveats and exceptions have made the promise far more entertaining than the reality, even across five editions. Uh, thanks for commenting, James. I gotta admit, it still surprises me. Like, this game's old. It's not new. It's been out since 1989. It's got five editions now. How it can have so many issues. And also, just as surprising that it can have that many issues and still have so many fans. I gotta say, overall, what it seems like is everyone loves that setting, despite the system that seems to be behind it. Now, we also got some feedback in our, on our last episode where we were talking gateway games, games to introduce new gamers. At Max Reno on Twitter wrote, happy to see Black Fleet on the list. I love that game. Not sure why it doesn't get that much love. Well, thanks, Max. I noticed it was on sale this week at Tabletop, Bell, uh, Tabletop Top Deals, so maybe with, with suggestions it can get a bit more love. Mm -hmm. Now, at Brock, Brock Wagner, uh, or sorry, at Brock, at Brock Wager on Twitter, Twitter writes, Hamster Roll may be the best game I've picked up on your recommendations in terms of showing off just how cool this hobby can be. That is awesome to hear, Brock. I love hearing when recommendations actually pan out. At New Wolfie, also on Twitter, writes, Great take on the topic. Several here, several here that I'd like to now pick up because I think they'd fit a specific niche with some family and friends. Well, thanks, and that's what we're here for. Do let us know how it turns out if you do pick them up. Now, Stephen Cornegay, uh, Cornegay, Cornegay, uh, had a quick comment on Shafausa. Uh, My wife bought Shafausa dirt cheap and we punched it out. Never have played it. I had a hard time getting past the component quality. I may give it another shot. Well, I'm glad we, I may have helped getting the game to the table. I got to say it is a mixed bag, it, the component wise. Um... But I liked the game for what it was, even if it didn't match the expectations set by the box. Now, the last comment is one for Sean here. It's about the Monster Box of Monsters expansion from Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle, something I haven't gotten to yet, but I know Sean has. Joshua Fulton wrote, The Box of Monsters expansion is definitely not what I was hoping it would be. While it does add a trashing mechanic, it's not a widely available action in the new Hogwarts cards, and it's not terribly useful either. We've defeated three of the four boxes, including the expansion, but we have to modify things to make victory even a remote possibility for all three boxes after getting thrashed our first three outings. Namely, we sort the Hogwarts deck into three piles, spells, items, and allies, so we don't get completely shafted by a terrible top of the deck. 
We also very specifically choose our random villains that get added with each current box of villains. The base game is challenging and fun, while the expansion is fun challenged. Now, I gotta admit, I like the way you worded that. Challenging and fun and fun challenged. I can think of that applying to quite a few games once you add expansions in. Now, Sean, I know your family's having a real hard time with book one. Your thoughts? Uh, well, technically, it's actually box one. Uh, it's books one through okay. seven, and then boxes one through four. It's right. just how the game refers to them. Uh, but I'm actually intrigued with this, because there is no question the expansion is harder. Period. Uh, but I find that a good thing. Uh, first off, regarding the trashing. Uh, it is specifically designed for the trashing of one type of card that's also new in the expansion. Uh, it is not intended to act like a uh, deck honing tool, like it would be in Ascension and other things. It's really just, if you get these one type of cards, there's a chance you can get rid of them again. Uh, because they've added this new card in. Um, and then, as for sorting the Hogwarts deck, I'm not really sure how that helps that much. Um, and in case you did get a really expensive opening draw where you couldn't afford any cards for uh, at all, um, they actually added in a specific mechanic to deal with that. There is a, a one, each player gets one full wipe of the Hogwarts uh, field uh, mm. every game. So they, they looked into that and they added that in there. So I'm, I'm not really sure how shuffling and sorting those out um, would help all that much. Now, when they talk about choosing the random villains, that I get. Uh, mm. There are some villain combos that are just cruel. Um, I, my first comes to mind is Fenrir Greyback and the Basilisk, which means you can't gain any hearts and you can't draw any cards. Um, mm. So you're, you're kind of <laughs> stuck. Um, it's, it's definitely harder, but as a lot of people had pointed out, other than game five in that first, in that first, uh, or the book five in the first box, it wasn't mm -hmm. that hard. So we actually played again uh, the other day. We'll talk about it more next week, but, uh, we nearly beat it. We didn't, but we got pretty close. So I, I'm not, I'm not ready to do any modifications other than I can, again, I can understand the, uh, the honing of the villains pile yet. All right, sounds good. And man, neither of us can read people's letters today. <laughs> I'm like, we almost need to do a retake of the entire reading of what people have said. That was that was a little rough. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here, what games hit our tabletops. Every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we've attended, and any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at tabletopbellhop.com under On the Table. This week, I burned my brain on Arkwright. I got to play a few date night games of War Chest and Onitama, played some Gloomhaven with only two people for the first time, and fought a battle in a galaxy far, far away. I've just got a bit of online play and some uh, DC Heroes deck builder. So I'm going to mix things up from the last few weeks, and I'm going to start with Gloomhaven instead of ending with it, just to keep everyone on their toes. So cold and flu season is in full force here in Windsor. It's it's nasty. Plus, there's the roller coaster like weather that is not helping at all. If it isn't an illness causing cancellation, it's freezing rain. Overall, this has meant a lot of people not showing up for game nights, and really for good reason. I'm even pretty much iced in here right now. This has been a rough winter all around, the worst uh, here in Hamilton in 10 years. Uh, and it's still only min not even middle of February. Yeah, I think the kids, it's starting to feel like, I don't remember the last time the kids went to school for a full week. Like, yeah. They're, they're missing at least one, two days a week right now. They exactly. did go today. They didn't go yesterday. Though This morning, I don't know if they should have went because we had white out snow. Yeah, even, anyway. even, even Toronto actually had a snow day for the first time since 2011. Wow, where they actually shut down the city. Yeah, yeah we haven't gotten that far. But anyway, either way, um, this past Friday... We found out nice and early, thanks Tori and Kat, that they wouldn't be able to make it out. So Deanna and I had to decide what to do. So now we talked about playing a player short last week, actually spent quite a bit talking about it last week. And the end decision that we decided that it was going to be random dungeons anytime where we don't have our full group. So that's what we did. We played a random dungeon. Now, last week we had talked about how the group considered four different options for what to do when a character's short. Check out our podcast number 28 to hear all those options and find out why a random dungeon was the best option for them. And I still think it is. 
This week, it was just my Savas Craghart and Deanna's Vermling Mind Thief exploring a randomly generated three-room dungeon. We started off in the foggy alcove, battling a couple of elemental demons. That went well with rocks flying everywhere and over pretty quickly. Room two, though, caused us some trouble. This was an infected burrow filled with ooze and giant vipers. Now, the vipers weren't too much of a problem, but man, those ooze gave us a hard time. By the time we were opening the door to room three, Deanna was down to four cards. Now, if you played Gloomhaven, that means two to three more turns max. Now, the last room was the Frigid Tunnel, which would have been easy on its own, but with our limited resources, we only barely managed to scrape by. Now, this room had this really badass Savis Ice Storm Summoner, one of the neatest bad guys I think we faced in the game, who just kept summoning more ice demons. By the time we finished, Deanna was literally one card away from being exhausted. Her next turn was to take a long rest so that hopefully her summon skeleton would do some extra work for it, but I did manage to finish off the Savas. It was a close fight, and I actually don't think we touched the extreme edition of the game. I think we didn't mess anything up. I think we played properly this time. Well, I know things look good from the stream side, and I didn't notice anything while we were kibitzing to make sure you remember to lay out the right number of foes. Yes, that was the thing I knew I, I shouldn't mess up. I got to say, overall, I like the random dungeon. It is a great way to play Gloomhaven when you don't have your group. It's a lot of fun. Two players seem to work pretty well. We definitely didn't get in each other's ways. Uh, there were no timing issues. Actually, timing was pretty simple. With two, it was really easy to go, I'm going quick, you're going slow, done. And we really didn't have to worry about that. Um, the two characters together, I got to say, the Mind Thief with the Craig Heart seemed to be a really powerful combo. Uh, it seemed to be working really well. So at this point, I'm going to stick with what we said last time. Random dungeon rules whenever there's a player short. Though I'm really hoping Tori and Kat can make it out this Friday and we can get back to the main campaign. Okay. So while you and Dee had your Gloomhaven night, my son and I had some DC Heroes deck builder. Uh, he is really loving it and very nearly beat me this time. Uh, if one of the supervillains hadn't allowed uh, me to steal away one of the one one of the supervillains that he'd won, uh, it probably would have gone the other way. Uh, and one thing I have to really say is that I'm liking how it's making him work way more with numbers. Um, you know, the, just doing the VP count at the end, um, he's only nine and he's you know piling through and, and working out some of the you know, there's, there's a bunch of different uh, variable victory point cards, uh, value cards, and he's he's coming up with good numbers every time. And, and I'm really enjoying that part of it as much as playing the game well. Uh, it's good to hear. I'm glad that suggestion has worked out. Have you considered picking up any of the expansion yet? Like you just have the base, right? Like the yeah. DC deck builder? Yeah. We just I know there's like 18 different versions. So And, and I'm, I'm trying to be good. I, I, yeah. I, have, I would love to. I would love to. But... Uh, we are still, uh, it is still making it to the table as the plain game. And right. uh, until it starts dying off a little bit, I'm going to try and uh, Wait. be good and, and not just overspend. Yeah, well, more willpower than I usually have. <laughs> <laughs> Up next for me is Arkwright. Now, a few things led to me getting this to the table twice this past week. Uh, first up was that whole play of Shafosa. Uh You want to hear about Shafosa? Check out the last episode, read the review on the blog. Uh, this is a bit of a bait and switch of a game. It looks like this fantasy romp, but it's really a pretty heavy economic game. Well, playing that decent economic game made me really want to play a really good, well-respected um, economic game with a lot of hype, something that I've read really positive reviews on. And I wanted one that wasn't just a veiled in some fantasy theme. Like, I, I wanted a full-on game. Along with that, there's a few new members who have joined the Windsor Gaming Resource, which is a group I run on Facebook that I use to organize local gaming events and meetups. These new members were commenting about most of the game nights at the local game stores, people seem to be playing lighter games, quicker, lighter, fair, and they were looking to set up some kind of heavy game night. So both of these led me right to Arkwright. So it's a game that's been on my pile of shame for over a year now. Now, Arkwright is a heavy economic game. It is literally the heaviest game I own, according to Board Game Geek's weight rating. It's way above Food Chain Magnet and surprisingly even higher than, say, Indonesia. So that's why it's been in my pile so long. This is the kind of game you need to pre-plan playing with, playing with a group of gamers uh, who have already bought in to this kind of experience. Yeah, you really can't throw a truly heavy game at a lot of players. It's just jarring. You need to pick your audience and make sure you have time, space, and all the other requirements in place to make this an enjoyable play. 
Yeah, I agree completely. This isn't something I just show up to game night and be like, hey, I set up Arkwright, sit down and play the guy that just walked in the door, right? It's it's not going to go over well. Uh, that's why I have games like Azul, and if I know they're a little heavier gamer, I pull out something like Terraforming Mars. No, Arkwright is something like, hey, well, actually, there was a guy who joined that was at the event that wasn't part of the planning that, like, we, guy came over and said, what are you setting up? And he asked, he's like, hey, can I play? And I'm like, all right, I want to give you some warnings. This is going to take three hours. This is going to be heavier. Are you sure you're going to, you want to be invested? He's like, no, 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 I'm into this. And then it ends up, he was part of the conversation. He just hadn't said he was going to be there that night. So Arkwright is a engine building game set at the turn of the century and the dawn of automation. Actually, it's named after Ar Charles Arkwright. I'm going to get the name wrong here because I didn't put it in the notes. Arkwright is the last name of the person who is who developed the first machine and is responsible for automation. Uh, players in the game are investors who are managing two to four startup companies in England with the goal being to have the most valuable block of stocks in their own companies by the game end. Now, this is a heavy economic game where players are operating, closing factories, hiring workers, uh, managing demand, developing their quality, automating manufacturing, paying wages, developing distribution networks, and more. Uh, it's Richard Arkwright. Thank you, Deanna, for the correction. Now, the game itself includes two ways to play. There's the simpler spinning Jenny version, which is named after his first machine, and then the full water frame version, which was named after his second copyrighted machine. Now, so far, I have only tried the spinning Jenny version. The main difference that I've seen looking into the water frame rules is game length and the fact water frame adds exporting and shipping to the game. I love the idea that the heaviest game in your collection has a light version that is still <laughs> yes. probably more daunting than most players would even be willing to try. Oh, I agree. Like this, 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 it, this was not a light game. The, a lighter version did not make it light. That that is definitely true. So as mentioned, I played twice. So once was two player with Deanna, where basically all we were trying to do is get the rules down before I brought it and tried to teach the public, especially I knew I had new people coming out who I hadn't met before. So I didn't want my first time teaching a game experience to be like, wow, I thought this guy knew what he was talking about. So it was kind of my practice run to try to get to the game. And then the second time was with that larger group, uh, which included three gamers I've never even met before. Uh, so we played a full four player game. So far, I really like it. Unlike Shafauza, it is as advertised. It's what you expect. It's what's in the box. It's a heavy economic game with lots of decisions, hard decisions, lots of options, lots of things to keep track of at once. Actually, to be honest, probably way too many things to keep track of at once, which is what makes it part of the game. Uh, it's definitely a brain burner and not a game. I at least I want to sit down and play twice in a row. Split it up by a day, sure, but twice in a row after we were done, I'm like, no, we play Gizmos or something where I can pick up marbles. Like at some point, while playing on Saturday at CG Realm, each of us grabbed our phones and brought up the calculator. It, each of us, all four of us, had to do it at one point. And one of the players at one point even pulled out a pen and a notebook and just to plan out her last turn to see if she could maximize her points. I, it's it's intense, and I'm really impressed. I like these kinds of heavy games. It's not the usual fare. It's not what I get to play all the time. I don't get to play games like that often, so it was nice to have this. It seems weird to call it this way, but a heavy game break. It was nice to get away from the lighter games. Now, I want to get a few more games in, and then I think I'll do up a full review of the game, and I'll get a lot more information. I'll put up a full blog post like I did for Shafausa. But at this point, I, I want to play some more. And I'm also not sure if I want to do up a review of just Spinning Jenny and then try Waterframe or if I'll do Waterframe first and then write up a full review of both. Well, that sounds like uh, quite the the deep dive into a game even <laughs> without really diving deep into it yet. The game itself is just so deep. Uh, the rest of my week was so light and simple comparatively. Uh, <laughs> I played the usual Board Game Arena uh, affair, although we had some close games wrapping up uh, yeah. it, it, with surprising results in Takedo. Yeah, it was definitely uh, some of those Takedo games. I had no clue who was going to win until the very end. And even then, it was like, oh, or it was like one card away. Like, I had two money left. And if I could have got that last meal, remember, yeah. Zen, game Zen. No <laughs> no one stole that meal from me. It was totally yeah. my fault I didn't get it. <laughs> Still yeah. love Takedo. Yeah, I know a lot of the, a lot, and a lot of those Takedo games. I think we're all getting 
that much better at it. And so the games are just ending up that much closer at the end. You just don't know who's going to win until those final uh, tallies are done. Which is a great sign of a good game, in my opinion. Yep. All right. So Sunday night. Uh, Deanna and I spent the night out of town. Uh, we were in, out in Kingsville at our favorite gastro pub. J- just happens to be an inn with a room upstairs. Uh, Jack's Gastro Pub. Food's great. They serve a mayor. Uh, uh, they serve amazing Ontario craft beers on draft. They have a and then having a room upstairs meaning no worry about driving home after those drinks. Uh, we like to do this a few times a year. It's it's definitely our favorite place to get away for a night, and of course play some games. So. We talked about date night games on the show before, actually specifically on episode 19, Two to Tango. And on Sunday, we played one of the games on that list a few times while waiting for dinner to show up. And that game is Onitama. Now, in this case, we played the app version. Jax isn't the kind of place you're going to pull up and set out a board and pieces and dice or whatever you need. Not that Onitama has dice. Cards, you're, you're, there's, there's, uh, just not the space on their tables. And in that case, there's nothing wrong with just playing a pass and play app, which is what we did. Sometimes you just have to work with the space you have. And when that space is none, you can still find a way to make do. Yeah. And the app version is, is of most games are pretty solid. The app version of Onitama is excellent. Actually, to be honest, it's basically perfect. Like it looks great. It perfectly duplicates the gameplay of the original. Like, There is no changes whatsoever. You can buy all of the expansions and even all the promo cards. And there are some app-only things that you couldn't do with the original game where you can change the theme. So instead of being like an Asian theme, you can make it look more like chess. Uh, I think there's a King Arthur theme. Uh, There's various themes you can set, which is obviously something you can't do with the physical game. But I don't like the app. I I don't know what it is. It's something to do with the fact it's all about spatial recognition and it just doesn't click in my brain looking at icons on my phone. Like I would much rather have actual physical pieces in front of me. For some reason, seeing the actual physical pieces, I can better visualize this guy's going to move here and he's going to move here and he's going to move here. And I was thinking about it when I was writing this and I'm like, man, I have the exact same problem with chess. Actually. Like I'm not a big chess fan, but over the years, I'd like if you ask me to play chess with a board in front of us, I'll probably say yes. Why not? I don't mind chess. But if you ask me, hey, play chess online, I have no interest whatsoever. I do not enjoy playing chess against a computer either, which is probably the best way to learn. I definitely prefer physical touching. I want the thing there. Like maybe it's just me, but like it's a great app. If you want an app version of Onitama, it's perfect. It perfectly recreates the board game. But I'd rather have my physical copy. Yeah, no, humans do some really interesting 3D processing just as an innate function of of how we interact with the world. Uh, And the physical action of touching pieces itself can be Mm -hmm. helpful. Uh, Grandmasters of chess will spend a lot of time just holding and feeling pieces as they they think and plan about and plan through moves and and train um, just to sort of interact with and connect with their pieces. Um, So there's definitely something to... That that physical uh, physical playing of a game, yeah, definitely. Like, it, it's just weird. Now, maybe I'm just complaining because I think I lost all three games in a row. Maybe <laughs> maybe that's why I feel that. But I'm like, usually only Tama, I'm hard to beat in that game. I just couldn't play it on the app. So after dinner, having a few drinks, we got up to our room and we had a table where we had a table, and I finally got to break out War Chest. I have been excited about this game since I got it for my birthday. Actually, I was excited about it before my birthday, which is why I wanted it for my birthday, and I was excited to get it for my birthday. Uh, both of us, Deanna, has been looking forward to it as well. Now, I first heard about this game on the Secret Cabal podcast, another excellent podcast. If you dig our show, you'll probably love their show. You got about six guys talking games there. Um, great group of guys really respect their opinions. What I like about them being six of them is you get a difference of opinion in the group. It's a nice touch. Uh, but anyway, the big thing that sold me on it from what them talking about it, besides just going on about how awesome it is, is that at least one of them, I think it was Jamie, claimed it replaced the Duke for them. Now, I love the Duke. The Duke, in my opinion, is my favorite two-player abstract war game. Like, if I had a Duke, Duke app, I would have been playing that, not only Tama. And probably also losing because I wouldn't figure out where the parts are going to go. But anyway, so hearing better than the Duke, I'm like, oh, man, I got to try this. And then I saw it. Oh, my God. Like, this is an amazing looking game. So now I'm like, 
not only is it supposedly play better than Duke, it looks amazing. So it's another abstract war game, but this one's hex-based. Players only have four types of units during each game, all of which are different from their opponents. So you're gonna each game's gonna have eight units total. Four you have, four I have, four your opponent has, four you have. Each of the unit is represented by like poker chips, basically, like really nice high-end poker chips. You're gonna take two chips of each type, throw them in a bag, along with this one bonus chip for your side. They call it the royal coin. Each turn you're gonna draw out three chips and use them to do stuff. Now the stuff you can do is putting units on the board, moving units already on the board. Recruiting new units, which is getting more chips into your bag, bolstering existing units, attacking adjacent units, and taking over control spots. And then oh, also stealing first player or passing. Now you win by taking over six of the control spots on the board. So it's Duke with area control? Uh, that is definitely part of it. Uh, you don't capture the Duke. Like the way you win is that it is similar to Duke in the fact that instead of how you move being on the chips, it's on the cards. So it's still pretty easy to see. You just have the four cards out in front of you and that tells you how each chip moves. Uh, it definitely does have that Duke feel of like horses can move two and um, pikemen can move one. I, I, I think that's a pretty apt description. So the thing is though, at this point, we've only played three games. And the three games we played, we played with the exact same forces on each side, just trying to figure out the rules. So the, the rules have a starter, starter armies. And we just took those two starter armies, went, you take these guys, I take these. Deanna wanted the wolves. I played the, I think, the ravens. And we went with those. Um, the rules are simple enough, but there are a lot of interactions going on especially due to the number of ways each coin can be used. So when you draw your three coins, you've got all those different action options with them. And some of them, you put the coins face up and some face down and some of it's hidden information. Some's not like there's, there's quite a bit going on. There's a lot of really interesting decisions to be made each turn and planning ahead does seem to be, be a big deal. So like strategy is definitely important as well as tactics. Uh, so far, we both enjoyed it a lot. I'm certain this one's going to see more play probably soon. And I'm going to wait a bit to let everyone know how my opinion has changed as we explore the game more. At this point, I'm pretty much sold on it. With only three plays and checking out eight of the included unit types, like, I already like it. And there's way more to see. Wow, that's great. Uh, so I know I'm really intrigued by this game. I, from the moment I saw that sitting on the one of your piles of shame, uh, yeah. when I was down for the last party. Um, and I certainly hope you don't sour on it because I definitely want to get it to get it on the table uh, when we can. At this point, I, it doesn't seem like I'd sour on it anytime soon. If, if it has any of the staying power of the Duke, it's going to be a while before I get sick of it. And like I said, we've just like barely scratched the surface. Like you're probably going to hear a lot more about this game in the coming weeks. We just need some time away from the kids to be able to play it. Speaking of the kids, the final game I played this week was Star Wars Destiny, that with uh, my oldest, Big G. Now, it's been months, like lots of months since we last played. I'm pretty sure it was July last year when we played. Now, at that point, all we had done is played with like the preset stuff. So I originally went out and I bought the, uh, it was called the two-player two player game. Two player, it's not a starter set. I think it may just say the two Star Wars Destiny two-player game. Might be how they branded it. And it's a standalone, you can play against each other deck. It's it's okay. Uh, then I went out and bought the Luke Skywalker starter set, like standalone starter and the Boba Fett starter set. And we played with those. And then we kind of mixed up the cards a bit and I bought two booster packs each. So four booster packs. And we sat down and finally made our first decks. The problem is um we didn't have time to play back then we made our decks and had to had to take off and just things happened right we ran out of time so last saturday though we did finally get to play those two decks against each other which thankfully we did a good job of separating everything so when we opened it up it was like oh we're perfect here's your decks here's yours here's your dice here's our dice and we were good to go now, the first thing that stuck out immediately is how much more fun the game is with a, a legal deck, a full 30 points worth of characters. And I couldn't have any parts, but whatever, a full deck of cards that go with the character cards. With all the preset decks, you only get two characters and two dice to use during the game. 
all additional dice come from supports and attachments. So your your starting army or whatever is just two. When building your own decks, you're much more likely to have three characters each with their own dice or two characters, one of which is going to start with two dice. Now, of course, the random distribution means you have to have those dice, but that's a separate problem. Now, with the small card set of cards we had and the dice we have, we couldn't do it. But I think if you had a large enough collection, you could even start with four characters or four dice in some combination. Probably if you did a bunch of weenies, like a bunch of stormtroopers, you could probably pull it off without having any of the named characters. But anyway, what all this means is you have more dice at the beginning of the game, which means there's more stuff to do and more options earlier in the game, and that's a good thing. So... Glad to hear this got back to the table. We've talked about you guys enjoying this, but I know there had been some annoyances with the way the company sold it. Um, I actually just came across, and, I, and I'm going to plug somebody else for a second here. Uh, TeamCovenant.com has a Star Wars Destiny's Buyer's Guide that okay. takes you through, and it starts with, you know, start with the two-player game. Buy this first, uh, and then buy Boba Fett and buy Luke Skywalker, and it just... Yeah. <laughs> and it, and it takes you through, it's a, it's a, a quite a long blog post uh, that takes you through how you want to go about buying, uh, buying your Destiny cards. Uh, and it's actually part of a nine-chapter Destiny oh, wow. player's guide that they've got on there. But that's teamcoven.com, learning Star Wars Destiny. Um, we'll have a blog in the, uh, we'll have a copy in, in the uh, show notes, I'm sure. But uh, that sounds uh, really decent. interesting. It's yeah, that's the thing I didn't really talk about much this time, but if you buy the base starter set and the Luke set and the Boba set, you still can't make a legal deck is what we found. Right. Sorry, we can make one legal deck. We could not make two legal decks, right. which I thought was a little ridiculous. Now, I did buy four packs of boosters with that. We could make legal decks, but I think it was um, Big G's deck was basically stuck with what we owned. Right. Like she didn't get to modify much. Now, I do have to send a, a shout out to uh, my cousin who did donate additional cards but that we don't someone doesn't know about those yet so right. we are looking forward to expanding the game somewhat apparently that the rivals draft set is uh is sort of the key to making it all happen so okay see i the other thing is i haven't kept up like since july they probably released two three new sets since i've even looked at the game right now overall i i gotta say we still like the game i it, we had a fun game big g and i both had fun playing it I got to admit, I'm not a big fan of the collectible nature. I do like the game itself. The gameplay is excellent. I like the combination of cards and dice. And, well, we're both huge Star Wars fans. So I just hope it won't be another eight months before we play again. So for those of you keeping track of the less shame, more game, pile of shame challenge, it is time for an update. This week, that is two more games off my pile of shame, Arkwright and War Chest. Gone. The pile of shame. There we are, down to 72 on the pile of shame. It's not bad. It's going pretty good. If I do two a week, though, I don't think I'll get through the rest of the year. <laughs> but two a week at this point? I, yeah, if I do two a week, I think we'll get through all of it. Yeah. I still don't expect to get through it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bog down into these like heavy war games. I'll be like, I'm never going to get these played. Those Valeria expansions, though, those might come off soon. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. We record the show live Wednesday nights at 9.30 Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. Don't forget, if you're here live, we continue the show after the Double Bell and an Off the Books after show, as well as some special features that might make it to YouTube from time to time. Thanks to our moderator, Angie Games. Tonight, in the chat, we have... Bringing up a list here. Apple I do have to apologize to Mr. Grim Smiles. I wanted to say hi, but I was, I'm trying not to interact with the lobby while we're in the middle of a thing. Obviously, someone local because they saw us playing on Saturday. I'm not sure who it is by name, but thank you for stopping by. I highly doubt you caught this in time, but if you do listen to the podcast, we do appreciate you stopping in. Yeah. So we've got uh, Poncho72, Red Ketchup, hey. uh, Red Ketchup FBI, Shadzar, Slow Cool are here. I know Cat was uh, popped in at one point. Uh, Mr. Grim Smiles had to depart, but thanks for showing up. Um, and Tech uh, 2674 was around as well. I don't see their name right now, but if they're still watching, thanks for coming out and uh, joining. It's weird because Kat noted that she was like here to stay this week. So I don't know. Uh, she's Maybe not chatting. She's just watching. She's yeah, just it's wa possible. 
Um, now, Shadzar was was pointing out, you know, when we were talking about the apps, a computerized version mm -hmm. of anything uh, is just a video game. It isn't like a real thing, like a board game. While programs that allow online play may help people play games, it just feels more like going through the motions, be it a board game, a card game, or an RGB. Or, our, yeah, or, or an RPG. RGB. RGB. It's, 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 it's colored now. <laughs> it's, uh, or, or an RPG. Um, and then, uh, I actually, he, he went on and started talking about how, you know, if, if you need a, a computer to play it, play it or, or, or to do it successfully, it should just stick to being a video game. I, to be honest, I got to say that I, I find that somewhat true. There are a few board games I have played over the years that I sit there about halfway through and go, you know what, this would just be better on a computer. Um, and ex you know what, Rark Wright is probably a good example. It's just the amount of math in that game. Although, it, to be honest, if it was all done for you, I think it would take out the joy in the game because you wouldn't be a, you wouldn't make mistakes, right? You could right. just like click on the different things to see the possible outcomes, and that would remove some of the game from it. But I know it's I think it was Clash of Cultures. It's one of the big heavy civ building games where you start off on a hex and you explore out. And there was a tech tree, and there were every time you got new technologies, you had to take little cards for each of the technologies. And the part that I remember really thinking should be a board game is there was a way to take over an adjacent civilization by just being more cultured than them. It was like the non-military way to take over. And I just remember that being so complex that I just wanted to have the computer do it for me. Like right. I want to get the right text and do the right thing. And all of a sudden I want his thing to change from his blue to my yellow without having to keep going. Oh, have I got it yet? And I, I have seen that. So I, I think he does have a valid point. Yep. The thing is I want that. Like I, what I'd rather see is if I had a big touch screen and we could still be at the table. Like that's the part that falls away. I want that social aspect. I want to all be sitting at the same table and talking about what we had for dinner in between turns and doing the whole interaction thing that you just can't do in a video game. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and she games has mentioned, uh, she's been playing Terra Mystica on board game arena and she's finding it hard because yeah. the brain works differently that way. Um, and then I look at something like, again, I was playing, uh, Ascension, um, this week. So it'll be, I'll talk about it next week, but uh, I, I finally picked up the last expansion, so I've got them all now. Uh, That's one of the Steam. dice. And I looked at the deck in a four-player game after the deal, and there's 1,150 cards in the main deck. Oh, my God. You can't. You just can't. Um, yeah, 1,150 right. cards. You can't shuffle that. I mean, even doing the box, oh. even doing the box method we talked about in the past, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's still ridiculous. Red Ketchup FBI, thank you for the bits. It is appreciated. Absolutely. Um, all right. We are growing through the support of fans like you. So if you haven't yet, please take a minute to subscribe, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share to your friends. Wherever and however you find us, you can help us grow. Uh, sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox where I can type better than I can talk, only because I have an editor. Uh, once a week, I'll be sending out an email recapping all the content we've released in the week previous. Uh, this includes bot blog posts. Bot blah, blah, blah. Wow. <clears throat> this is terrible this week. I don't know. Can't talk. This is what happened. I switched to black coffee. That's what happened. That, that, that is my big life change. As of this week, I now drink black coffee. Welcome to the rest of us. <clears throat> Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I will be sending out an email recapping all of the content we've released in the weeks previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, YouTube videos, unboxing, reviews, and anything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage and you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. In just... Over a month until breakout. I am so looking forward to it. It is going to be fantastic. March 15th to 17th, all three of us will be there. Toronto, Ontario. Looking forward to this fantastic smaller gaming convention that features all forms of gaming, RPGs, LARPs, miniatures, and a fantastic board game room with a huge game library, along with some of the most diverse and interesting panel discussions covering all manner of topics. I did see something today. I tweeted at them and asked if I should bring my Keyforge decks. 
and they said we are working on organized play so there may be a key forge something fantasy flight there i'm Ooh, hoping nice i am hoping i'll be bringing my decks yep if anyone listening is going to be there and wants to meet up hit me up on social media we'll try to work something out speaking of hitting me up we are looking for advertisers designers publishers writers writers writists writists all you writers out there, we want you. Writers, artists, creators, creatives. We want to promote your thing. We want to work with you. Social media. Uh, no, not at all. Uh, <laughs> we are looking to do a 30-second mid-show segment for the podcast in all its forms, live, YouTube, and in audio. We're looking for sidebar ads for the website as well. We're usually more professional than this, but... I don't know. We're, we're off the ball today. But if you are interested, fire off an email to mo at tabletopbellhop.com. I have been talking to a couple people. So far, it's up in the air. They, 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 they want to work with us, but they're not ready to promote their thing yet. So it's stuff that's coming in the future. Trust me, we're not going to be expensive. <laughs> we are looking for advertisers. Hey, designers, publishers, writers, artists, creators, and creatives. Let us promote your thing. We're looking to do a 30-second mid-show segment for the podcast in all of its forms, live, YouTube, and audio, and we are looking for sidebar ads for the website. If you're interested at all, fire off an email to me at mo at tabletopbellhop.com. We'll hook you up. Most episodes, we look to answer one or more of your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to the tabletop... <laughs> Yeah, we're doing awesome. <laughs> or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Social media works too. We're pretty much everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop one word. Well, the best way is for questions to come through the website. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. This week, we are talking about what to do when you open up a game, all excited to learn it and get it to the table, but find inside a terrible rule book. Charles Baroche asks, Baroche, Baroche, um, why is it that no one seems to know how to write gaming rules that can be understood clearly? I spend a lot of time on Board Game Geek or tracking down a gamer who can teach. Uh, Charles, I got to say, I don't know. I, I don't know why no one seems to be able to write rules that can be understood correctly. I, I can't answer that specific question. What I can answer and what I do know is it's not intentional. It really isn't. Game publishers don't intentionally write bad rules. Game designers don't write bad rules. Game localizers don't publish bad rules on purpose. It's quite the opposite. Publishers want the rules to be as clear and easy to understand as possible. They want you to pick up the game, learn it quickly, and get it to the table right away in the shortest amount of time possible. They want the rules to be easy to read, and they want you to enjoy and play their games. I know I have some thoughts on what causes it, but dealing with it, that's the real problem everyone needs to solve, no matter what caused the problem. Very true. So, really, why is it that there are so many rule books that are hard to fathom? Now, like, really, it could be a lot of things. As Sean said, he's got thoughts on some of them. Here's some of mine. Like, the, the most common being is has got to be the company doesn't hire an editor or possibly, more importantly, hires the wrong kind of editor. Because it's a totally different kind of editing when editing something for spelling or grammar or editing fiction than it is editing game rules and mechanics. Game rules are basically technical documents, and you need someone that can edit technical documents. A technical writer, a technical editor, these are real and specific job titles with different requirements than their non-technical equivalents. An editor is not an editor for anything. Correct. Very true. Uh, and let's agree, uh, Shadzar's bringing this up to the chat. What I'm going to mention right here, too, is one thing that sadly seems to be becoming more and more common instead of less common is like the game designers think the rules make perfect sense, right? To them, they're clear, right? They wrote the rules. It, it makes sense to them. And they've used it many times to teach their friends. And then their ten friends have taken those rules and taught others what could be wrong with them. It works for them great. The problem is they're gaming in a bubble. It's a bubble that's filled with all kinds of special knowledge and unwritten rules that the group is probably totally unaware of. It all makes perfect sense to them, and it's not until the rules get out to the public that they find out that 
really, it's almost in another language. Now, I'm really seeing this with Kickstarter a lot and other independently published games, not even necessarily Kickstarter, but any crowdfunded or independently published game. Just if you are designing a game and you are going to publish it on Kickstarter or put it out on drive through RPG or drive through cards, just make sure strangers touch it and play it before you publish it. And I'm going to take that one step further, actually. Give it to strangers and leave. Take yeah. everyone who's ever played mm -hmm. the game before and go have a coffee. And don't come back until they're either done playing the game or have called out in desperation because of their confusion. It is way too easy to not notice that you are compensating for bad rules with your knowledge. Uh, and a perfect example is uh, playtesting at using cons or trying or getting that game out there at cons. Mm -hmm. uh, I sat down and uh, did a playtest at uh, break or not breakout con at uh, QCC Queen Queen City Conquest. Queen City Conquest, and the designer was there, and one of his friends who was working with him on the design was there. Uh, and I have absolutely no idea if the rules are, were any good or not, because it was the designer sitting there talking us through things. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the game, you know, for what it was, it had some, uh, it had some issues and we talked to the designer about those issues, but when it comes to the actual rules implementing, whether or not the game was good or not, I don't know if those rules were even, you know, right. re readable. Yeah, very true. Very true. You need uh, outside opinion and as sean noted it you need it to be not influenced yeah. you need a i'm trying to think of the technical term a clean sample right yeah. like a you need it you can't you don't want to mix it up you don't yeah. want you go in and help you're gonna ruin that all right unrelated to that or possibly related to that is translation issues this this can be huge like the reason i'm answering this question and we're talking right now is because i tried really hard to play chaffel the last week a game that sat on my pile of shame for three years because I couldn't figure out the rules due to translation issues. Like, I got to admit, in this case, sometimes it feels like publishers use Google Translate. That is not a good tool. Just avoid it. Uh, English, or its re various regional equivalents, is a real problem. Uh, grammar just does not translate well, or sometimes at all, the way words do. And it takes someone more than just fluent in both language to be able to make a translation make sense to mm. others and not just the translator. Again, that translator is looking at both the sentences and understanding it, but that doesn't mean that a, a non-native speaker of the original language would be able to do the same thing. Again, something that can benefit from a separate, unrelated set of eyes. Totally agree. The other thing, too, is your translator, your... Um, Play testers, well, play testers would do this, but your your editor and translators should try the game, play the game, because I've seen it out there where people have explained that, oh, sorry, our editor never played the game, so they didn't realize, get it. They just, I'm like, but like you want your rules to be cruel. You you want someone who plays games. But anyway, I, really this, we're, we're kind of spinning our wheels here. It, whatever the reason the rules don't make sense isn't what this is about. It doesn't matter. Just realize it's not intentional. Like, don't go out and blame. Like, you can blame the publisher and say, hey, you guys wrote a bad rule book. But, like, they're not doing it to screw you over. Like, that just doesn't make sense. They want to sell their game. Publishers and people want their games played. Now, there may be alternatives to a bad rule book. And that's what I want to dive into here. What do you do when you've got that bad book in front of you? Do you just put the game back on yourself and or put it in the extra life auction? You know, I almost did that with Shafosa. But nowadays, there are many alternative ways to learn how to play a game, and we're going to look at a few of those. The best games, as we say, are the ones that get to your mm -hmm. table. So let's get more games to your table, even if you don't think there's a way to play them. <laughs> Very true. Up first, for me, and for many people nowadays, are instructional videos. Learning games by videos is still pretty new, but man, is it popular. Uh, if you go on social media and you see the polls people put out and companies put out about how do you like to learn games, every year I see that number of I watch videos going up and up and up and the people who say I learn from the rules going down and down and down. For many people, watching to play a video is the primary way to learn to play a board game nowadays. To the fact that many game companies are jumping on board and will often include a QR code or a link 
to a how to play video right in the box or in the rule book itself. Now, there are lots of channels to, to do this. I'm going to recommend some that I personally have enjoyed or used. Uh, one of the most well-known channels is Watch It Played by fellow Canadian Rodney Smith. Rodney produces excellent quality videos, uh, both ones he does on his own and ones that game companies pay him to do. He does do both. And I find them fantastic for learning games. And one of the things Rodney is renowned for, and heads hat tip to him, is he is the most impartial person I have seen in the game industry. He will tell you how to play the game. He will never tell you if he enjoys the game or not. For him, it is just about imparting the knowledge, which is a great place to be when you're just there to teach games. You're not a reviewer. Now, I am also a fan of Rado of, and his Rado runs through videos. Uh, his real name is Richard Ham. Uh, he not only teaches the game, but goes through a few turns of each game after teaching the rules. He uses YouTube primarily and breaks it up really interestingly. So you can just watch the setup. And then he has, if you want to watch, the first few games, you know, keep watching. If you'd rather skip to my final thoughts, go here. And then he'll do a couple turns. And if you'd like to watch our extended gameplay, you can click here and watch the full game. It's extremely well done, almost like a which way book of learning the rules of a game. The one thing to note, though, is Rado teaches everything as if it's him and his, I'm not sure if it's wife or girlfriend, significant other Jen playing the game. So everything is taught two players only. Now, he will explain where the rules differ. Like, if we were playing a four-player game, it would do this. What I really like Rado for is finding when there's part of a game I don't get. So, say I'm sitting down to play Shafausa, and I'm like, wow, I get it, but I don't get the speculation phase. I find Rado perfect for getting to that part of the game, watching him play through a turn of the spe speculation phase, jumping ahead to the second round where he plays it again, going, oh, okay, now I get it. That's where I dig Rado. Now, my other go-to for video tutorials is gaming rules. I, I first found Paul Grogan through buying a Stronghold game and having a link to his channel in the box. Now, Paul is basically the same thing as Rodney Smith, but he also does reviews, and you can get more of his opinions on games. I think he's just as good at teaching, uh, excellent playthroughs, excellent setups. I find him very succinct. Now, there are lots of other people out there doing these as well. Tech, even us, we've got a couple out there now. What I suggest is try out a bunch. Go on YouTube, search for the game name, you're going to find them. Go on Board Game Geek. Board Game Geek now, when you scroll down, has all the videos highlighted. They're actually really pushing video content recently. Find the ones you enjoy the most. Find the ones that work for you. The one thing I do have to say, please, if you find someone doing tutorial videos and you like it, subscribe to their channel. Turn off notifications if you don't want to get emails every time they put up a new video, but subscribe to them. Not only is it a good way to say thank you to them, it also helps get their videos more views and break through any of the YouTube filtering algorithms. And now, despite what we do here, I'm actually not a huge fan of learning things by <laughs> video. Uh, but that being said, there are many things uh, that I do find some content providers who, you know, just put out a video that works for me. Uh, and when I went, you know, when I need to learn that way and the, it can take time and a lot of trial and error to find those people sometimes, but odds are good that once you find someone that does one video that works for you, you'll find more of their content that also works for you because they usually have a specific style. So take the time and, uh, you know, make sure you do lock on to that, that person when you find them. Up next, I've got uh, player aids and rule summaries. Now, I got to say, I love it when a publisher includes these in the box. Give me a rule summary sheet, please. Give me card-based player aids. Put the scoring right on the board. Give me as much of that as possible, please. Sadly, it's not common. And that's when I run to Board Game Geek. This goes back to the original question Charles asked. Like, he notes the same thing. He has to run to Board Game Geek for these kind of things. Sad that we have to do it. But I swear... Almost very, very close to every game I've ever bothered to look up has at least one rule summary created by fans on Board Game Geek. I say almost because I couldn't find one for Shafosa. There are probably other games out there, but almost every single game, someone's made something for it. Now, I got to admit, they all vary widely in quality. It's often worth looking at a few different files and not just grabbing the top one off the list. 
Now, Board Game Geek does have the thumb system, and I do have to say, in general, I tend to agree with most users. On Board Game Geek, if you grab the one with the most thumbs, that's probably the best place to start. But check out more than one. Now, another company that specifically specializes in rule summary sheets is a company called the Esoter Esoteric Order of Gamers, or EOG. They now have a ton of resources for almost 300 different games as of when I first looked this up. Now, originally they just did rule summaries, but now they do rule summaries, reference sheets, they're doing reviews. And now the interesting one that I've noticed they've added is foam core box insert plans for various games. But really what we're looking at here are these reference sheets and the the uh, blah, blah, blah. rule summary sheets. They are fantastic, like full color, print them out, intro page, using all the icons from the game. They get permission to do this. Like that's why they only have 300 games. They look fantastic. And I got to admit, they're often better than the rule books. Now, even if the rules are well-written, some games just have so much information to keep track of. The summary sheet means you don't have to flip through that book mm -hmm. Trying to find that one detail you forgot, which is rarely in the place you wanted it or needed it to be. Yeah, ever, it's never in the place. So it's always in the last place you look. There you go. One thing to check, though, before, possibly even before going to Board Game Geek, I do it. I go to Board Game Geek first. I'll admit it. I'm bad for this. But go to the publisher's website because it's highly possible that if their rule book's bad enough, someone's already let them know and they've already updated it. It's rare nowadays to find a publisher that doesn't have a PDF on the, their website. Actually, it's rare enough that like a company that doesn't should be called out for not having it. So it's worth checking. See if there's a, a file online that's different than what came in your box. Now, in some cases, these rule books are so bad that the publishers are even willing to send you a shiny new print copy of the rule book. Going back to that whole, they want you to be able to play the game. They really do feel bad when they put out bad rule books. Now, this recently happened to me with the Conan board game, the big box miniature game put out by Asmodee. Now, I just got shipping notification yesterday for those books. So they are sending me totally free three full replacement rule books. And I'm looking forward to finally getting to play that game because the original rule book is a total mess. Many publishers, especially smaller ones, are quite active on Board Game Geek and will often pop into forums mm -hmm. on their games to help clarify their own rules when there are questions. Uh, I'd actually be interested to see how many of these same people put out errata based off of those discussions on BGG on their website. Uh, and interestingly, I, I actually just on a whim said, oh, I wonder if the DC card building game has anything mm -hmm. on there. So I went to their website because I hadn't and I click on uh, game forums and it brings me to the BGG game forums. <laughs> Oh, so um, DC so Cryptozoic is Cryptozoic right to board Geek. links right to Board Game Geek for their forums. Oh, they don't even have be, their, they don't even have their own. To be honest, they don't need it. Like it's it's there. The resource is there. Yep. I like yeah. Sean's definitely right though. Like uh, there are some publishers that are fantastic for this. Uh, we talk about Gloomhaven a lot. Isaac Childress frequents Board Game Geek. He goes right on the forums and he updates and answers rule questions. And then he has his own post that is the master FAQ and he does update it. Okay. Now, I don't know if you go on the Cephalofair site, if that links back to BGG or anything, but yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, any designer that can do that props to them. It's, that is fantastic to see. So it would be nice if they got the rules right the first time, but we understand things happen. So up next are apps because there is an app for that. There, there probably is in most cases, uh, more and more publishers are putting out app versions of their games as well as some publishers are putting out helper or companion apps for their analog games. Now, first I wanna look at actual apps versions because all app based games are going to include not only rules, but most of them are gonna have really detailed tutorials. They're gonna teach you the game very slowly. Uh, these are often great for learning the games as well. I found as pointing out things that I've played wrong in my physical copy. For example, I had been playing the extreme version of Raw for about 12 years until I had finally played the app and went, oh, we've been scoring that wrong. Do be careful, though, as in some ways, apps can gloss over things, especially scoring. Uh, there can be some intricacies in, in the, ga the game whirls through in a blur, and when you transition to a physical uh, board game, those details become murky at best. 
Uh, mm -hmm. This is something I found with Takedo when I play, finally played it for real. Uh, you, you forget about just how much physical interaction there should be and needs to be uh, when you're playing through that game in, in reality. Just as an example of a game that does it right, though there's a new version coming, is Eclipse. Wow, the Eclipse app that slowly teaches you, that one's really good for that. Another example is Suburbia, because there's a way to play through where you play a little solo campaign, where you're trying to just build little things that really teaches you the interactions of the different tiles. So I personally got to say, it's it's pretty solid way to learn a lot of games. Now, besides full games, many companies are now doing companion apps. And a lot of these include the rules. Now, in some cases, like XCOM, which we covered, I couldn't even tell you, quite a few episodes ago, the only rules you're going to find in that game is the app. The only thing that's in the book is a sheet that says, go download the app. Now, the other thing you keep seeing more and more of are third-party apps for published games, some of which are starting to include rule references and FAQs. Third-party apps are both a boon and a problem indicator. While it's yeah. fantastic that people are stepping up and helping out by making something to help players, uh, and some of them are great, like really fantastic apps are out mm -hmm. there. The fact that some games have a dozen apps to help players <laughs> means that there's a real need for apps to help players. Uh, and that is probably caused by a problem with the game or rule design that other people are covering for. Yeah, and that even goes back to what Shadzar was talking about when we checked in with the lobby last time about maybe some games are better off staying in the digital world if there's that much that needs to be tracked. Yeah. Well, not quite an app, but definitely digital. Rules only being online is becoming more and more common. Like, this is the case where you don't get a rule book with the game. This has happened to me two or three times, not often. In a way, I get it, right? It makes sense because the publisher now has control over what rules are out there. And if there are changes needed, they can just update that digital file. Then anyone new grabbing the rules is going to get the latest version. Now, that also means they anyone who already downloaded them needs to check for updates. And then the publisher has to find a way to notify people of those updates, right? So... I, I, to me, this is still a murky, growing, changing thing, and it does seem to be a shift that's happening in the industry. Like, there is a lot of buzz right now, uh, both positive and negative, regarding Fantasy Flight going this way with Keyforge. There are people who love it and think it's fantastic, and there are people who totally hate it. Uh, and this isn't really new, uh, although it is becoming more mainstream, especially with Keyforge. Uh, one of the big problems, of course, with it is making sure that you have the newest version mm -hmm. of the rules. Uh, you know, if you haven't checked that Keyforge updated their rule book yesterday, you could be playing an extreme game, even though you're following the rules because your rules are no longer at, uh, up to date. Uh, yeah, I, I know. I know locally, this has become a huge issue with X-Wing where they keep updating. It's not the rules, it's the errata. So the rule book hasn't changed, but some ship had a broken whatever, or something was doing too much damage, so they changed it, right? And I know collectible card game players are used to this as well, but I know locally they're doing official sanctioned tournaments, and they are having issues where, like, someone shows up to play on Sunday, and it's, they haven't read the latest FAQ. They don't know that this ship's now whatever. I don't know X-Wing well enough to use specific examples. Yeah, the, yeah, I I first learned about this sort of thing back when the root, uh, living rule book for Blood Bowl came out uh, when their publishers oh, yeah. weren't supporting it. Uh, you know, so online rules go back quite a ways. Yeah, though with Blood Bowl, I think it was more the case that the fans created it, but well, yeah, there, there it was did no have choice. that aspect. Yeah, there was yeah. no choice but to use the living uh, living rule book online because the publishers walked away from it. Yeah, exactly. Much to to many people's chagrin, though now they're back. Yep. Which makes me wonder, I wonder what happened with the living rule book, if it's still a thing. Uh, it, uh, it, they basically closed up shop. It hasn't been updated yeah. in a few years. That makes sense, in a way, now that the game's back supported. So then the other thing, uh, app, they're not app-based games, but you've got all the online gaming websites, right? We talk about Board Gaming Green a lot. At some point, I'll check out the other ones right now. That's where I prefer to play. But there's also Tabletop Simulator, Yukata.de, and probably about 40 other ones I'm not thinking of right now. I find these are also good for not only reading the rules because they're pretty much all there, not always pretty, but they're there in text, but trying out the rules. So uh, as we've mentioned on the show multiple times, some games aren't bad to learn on it, 
but some are absolutely horrible to learn on it. But if you're already dealing with a bad rule book that's in the box, it's worth a shot. Yeah, I've had both experiences on Board Game Arena myself already, with Tokaido being a delight to learn there, and Race for the Galaxy being a tragedy. Uh, I find if you can learn it by reading the rules, Board Game Arena works really well, as they have the rules right there under the game. Uh, they even actually usually link to other resources for learning the game as well. Uh, some games, though, you just need to get your hands on. Uh, personally, I am always going to learn a game better with my hands on the pieces and the rules in front of me. That's just how I have had the most success. So lastly, there are a growing number of apps designed for teaching you games, apps-based learning. Uh, the big one everyone's talking about just had a very, very, very successful Kickstarter is Dice or Diced. I'm still not sure which is the proper it's pronunciation. Diced. I think it's Dyes, D-I-Z-E-D. This is an app that claims you will never need to read a rulebook again. That is their pitch. Personally, I checked out their Gloomhaven stuff and found I would much rather stick to the physical rulebook. It was all a bunch of menus and having to search for things, and I couldn't just sit there and read. Now, I will admit the app is still in development, and maybe they'll eventually get to the point where it would replace the rulebook. But man, people are clamoring and claiming that this is the next big thing. And as far as I know, Dyes isn't the only one. There are other companies trying to do this. This seems to be the next step. Well, while I'm intrigued by this, and I'm hopeful, I am very, very skeptical about Dyes in particular. Uh, they are, really are great at marketing, mm -hmm. and they're very eager. But the buy-in required by companies to uh, fill out their two-year plan, they've got a two-year rollout plan for their content. Um, and, and I don't understand why companies would. Um, that there's really nothing... But there's no reason why you would necessarily go to dies. where if you have to generate all this content in the first place, you wouldn't just do it yourself and do your own app. Um, and what I remember, though, they have a pretty significant list of publishers already on board. They do, but that's mostly just rules. Um, they haven't gotten all the other content that's really going to separate them. The actual tutorials? Yeah, uh, and, and they even have some tutorials, but they've got a lot of, a lot of different play-by-plays. And, and right now... Their primary, they, their primary thing is we have FAQs, searchable FAQs, yeah. and searchable rulebooks, which is which, great, but that's a PDF. That's Yeah, that's the internet. Um, right? And so, again, they've got two years of this rollout uh, where they're going to have, you know, video tutorials and step-by-step -step interactive tutorials and things. And, and you know, unless some com game company is going to let them completely do it on their own, mm -hmm. um, and maybe that's the case, but if the comp game company has to do anything, I can't believe they'd they wouldn't rather keep it in house and do their own app. Yeah, it would, seems like it would make sense. I don't know. They they had a lot of pitch, and a lot of people obviously believe in them. So yeah, in a way, I wish them luck. I I'll oh, probably sit sitting absolutely. here with my rule books, but yeah, no, heck, absolutely. if I could have downloaded a dies for Shafosa, I would have done it. So <laughs> so. What that leads me to is, in my opinion, the best way to learn a new game, which is to have someone teach you how to play it. Now, we've got two different podcasts talking about teaching games, one about teaching games in general and one about teaching games to new players. But what we don't really have is how to find a teacher. The thing is, that's a big topic and one that we're going to have to leave for another day because we don't have all night. I will just say, try checking things like Meetup and Facebook to see if there are any local gaming events in your area. Check with your local game stores to see if they have open game nights where they're going to have people on hand teaching games. Basically, get yourself out there and meet other gamers. Just remember, like videos and other methods, different teachers may be better for you than others. That is, unless they followed our guidance, and then they <laughs> should be able to help you just right. There you go. The bellhop method of teaching. I'll start selling PDFs on how to teach games and then we'll actually get rich because it seems like people selling tutorial PDFs on everything get rich, except for the people, especially the people who sell tutorials on how to sell tutorials, yeah. teaching PDFs. That's the real key. <laughs> exactly. I figure we got to go at least one year before we can put out our how to podcast episode and actually make it. Right. Well, this was a great talk. If you'd like to read more gaming and game night topics like this, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice, where you'll see this and other questions answered in blog form. Send your questions over on the website under Ask the Bellhop or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com.
Now, a quick shout out and a thanks to our Patreon backers. Their support helps make this show possible. Misdirected Mark, join Phil, Chris, and Bob, and now Camden every Tuesday night at their new time, 8 p.m. Eastern, as they talk games and game mastering and check out interesting independent role-playing games during their exploratory play. Brian Kurtz, thank you, Brian. Duran Barnett, thanks. Joe Swick, thank you. Jeff Seuss, haven't seen you since my birthday. We need to game together soon. It's been a while. William Fisher, thanks. Diane Tuzano, thanks, Mom. And Danielle Thomas, thank you. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift is coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though so the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to help support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Live to hit your podcatchers on YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thanks for joining us and hang around and join us in the penthouse suite for the Off the Books After Show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on.